uh, welcome back. Uh, now we start the fourth session of this uh, workshop, the second of this uh, of today. And um, the team will be rubber and climate change in the international for fora. We are going to have uh, three speakers, uh, Vincent Gitz uh, from CIFOR, Alexander Maybach from CIFOR as well, and uh, Dr. Lechmina here from ISG. So uh, after the presentation, we are going to have a panel discussion similar to what uh, to, to the one that just uh, ended, and uh, also a question and answer session. So I would like to invite uh, Vincent Gitz to give uh, his presentation first. Vincent, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Salvatore, and good uh, afternoon to all. So let me. Uh, share uh, the screen here and put it on full screen. I hope you hear me okay. It's fine. Yes. Uh, so one of the objective of this workshop uh, was to connect from a, from a science and evidence-based perspective uh, the knowledge about challenges and opportunity to, to the climate change community, and that includes climate change related policies at different level, national and international level. So uh, I, I hear uh, my, my, the objective of this presentation is, is, is just to, to sketch some of the existing uh, uh, ways and proceeds in this world of, of climate change uh, policy and, and implementation so that we can then discuss what it means for 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 rubber, and I'll focus at the at the international level more, and I th I think Alexander will look more at the at the national level, and after that, after then Lex Mee's presentation, I hope we can have a first uh, discussion. So, uh, the as an introduction, when we look at when we talk at forestry from the forester's perspective, and we talk about climate, we think oh, it's about red plus and protecting forest, uh, but red plus was to protect, to protect forests and from degradation, from deforestation, but was not adapted specifically to, to the needs of rubber. In fact, in the rubber context, uh, rubber was rather felt as all the, other, all the other plantation as contributing to deforestation. And even though, even though in the definition, rubber plantations are considered uh, as forests. So there is something that has changed in 2015 with the Paris Agreement. Of course, Red Plus is still there for the forester perspective, but there is a new, uh, we need really to take the full dimension of what has changed with the Paris Agreement. There is no first uh, bottom-up approach that is involving all countries and that uh, increasingly involves other actors. There is also a much more holistic approach to the land use sectors, particularly for developing countries, and there are more consideration for, for synergies. And all of this creates considerable opportunities for, to increase the visibility and the integration of, of rubber. But, but to seize these opportunities, we need to understand and engage uh, where we can engage with the negotiation process uh, on climate change and, and, and propose a way forward. So here in this, in, in, in this presentation, I'll, I'll dig a little bit into what kind of new opportunities the Paris Agreement gifts for, for land use and natural rubbers. We'll, we'll, we'll look at the entry points uh, in UNF CCCs and, and related bodies and, 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 and start with to discuss key points for, for a strategy for, for, for rubber. So first, yes, as I briefly outlined, the price agreement really creates new opportunities for land use and, and natural rubber. Um, the goal of the price agreement, some of you know them well, holding the increase of the uh, global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and to pursue effort to limit the temperature increase to 1.5, recognizing that this would significantly reduce the risks and impacts of climate change. Um, second, increase the ability to adapt to the adverse impacts of climate change and to foster uh, climate resilience and low greenhouse gas emissions development in a manner that does not threaten, and that's really important, that does not threaten food production. And then the issue of making finance flows consistent with a pathway towards low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. So all of these 
are goals from the climate point of view, but they're also goals, in fact, for the rubber sector as a whole and how it can contribute to the economy. So until the Paris Agreement, there were really two different categories of countries, the Annex I countries and the non-Annex I countries. And, and this had had in the past very important consequences on the way land use activities were considered with, with rep, red plus activities in non-Annex I countries to reduce deforestation and forest degradation to be financed by developed countries. And for Annex I countries, a much broader coverage of land use activities, including agriculture and land use, land use change and forestry, the so-called LULUCF. But with the Paris Agreement, all land use activities are now covered in all countries. Um, so the Paris Agreement recognized the importance of land use for the achievement of its, of its goals. Uh, it is, it is, there is no better recognition of synergies and trade-offs between mitigation and adaptation. And there is better recognition of, of synergies with sustainable development. Well, this is all the social and smallholder discussion we had before that is put back uh, at, at, at the center. And a better coverage of land use activities globally, but there's still progress to be made on in the integrative approach across sector, not only agriculture and forestry, uh, and this is, uh, we're going to talk about the Coronivia joint work on agriculture. So what does it mean as opportunities for natural rubber? Um, well, first of all, uh, the points we've just uh, discussed, but there is also the, 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 the issue, and Alexandre will, will tell about that, about the bottom-up approach. The NDCs uh, from countries, countries have suggested, have submitted NDCs, to the Paris to the to to the Paris Agreement and are they implementing the NDCs and these NDCs give give also more importance to initiative of actors other than governments including the private sector so just to to come very briefly uh, to the UNFCCC main bodies and related instruments just to understand that and it's I think a very important point for us that the, 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 the climate convention here in green and, and now with also the, 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 conven the convention for, for the parties of the Paris agreements are linked, but they are, are evidence-based, they are science-based, there are two bodies, the, the sustainable the sub subsidiary bodies on science and technical advice and the subsidiary body on, on implementations. Uh, both, both of them assist the governing bodies and the countries through the provision of timely information and advice either on scientific and technological matter for the substa or on implementation matters for the SBI. And they are all science-based and, 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 and evidence-based. Uh, there, there are also a range of other bodies uh, with other specialized functions that, that are also interesting for, for us as pathways to, and for the rubber community as pathways to engage. The adaptation committees, the least developed countries expert group, the technology executive committees, and the climate technology center and, 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 and network. And this is important as technology transfer is now an increasingly important topic in the implementation of climate change uh, solutions. And, and then when we come to the funding component, there is also a range of funds that have been put in place, some older, some more recent. Uh, just mentioned that in this slide, but the Green Climate Fund now is, is, is a central one. It is funding. Uh, mitigation 50% and adaptation 50%, and this is potentially a very important um, um, component for engaging with a, a rubber development project uh, and climate resilience. Um, all of this, um, uh, the, the 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 national um, the nationally de de determined contrib contributions are submitted by parties. They have no necessarily um, uh, predetermined format they have to cover mitigation and uh, can include uh, adaptation. So let me just go here. Uh, uh, that these, yeah, sorry, I was, I was, I was forgetting to, to put up the slides. The main topics for, for interest, interest and entry points. So the NDCs submitted by countries, they were set up in 2015, start in 2020, reviewed every five years to be gradually more ambitious with the first stock take in 2023 and then every five years, no predetermined format. They have to cover mitigation and they can include uh, adaptation. 
Then I mentioned the Katowice climate package uh, we, that has provided operational guidance on, on how the Paris Agreement can be implemented. So not all of this is finished. Uh, it's still uh, much under, under discussion, but in this package, uh, you have a, a inception information on how uh, domestic mitigation and other climate goals and activities that, go that government should provide within the government contributions. Uh, how to communicate efforts about adaptation, the rule of the so-called transparency framework where countries can show uh, what they're doing about climate change, the establishment of a committee to facilitate the implementation of the Paris Agreement and promote compliance with, with the obligations, uh, and how the global stop take uh, every uh, five years, the first one in 2023, will be conducted to assess progress towards, towards these, the objectives. Um, there is a very important point about the transfer of technology. Uh, that is also uh, a, a, a matter of guidance and the um, advanced information on financial support to developing countries and the process for establishing new targets from finance from 2015 onwards. A very important article in the Paris Agreement is Article 6. Uh, the mechanisms in Article 6 are, are still under discussion, that they're, they're broadly defined in the Paris Agreement. Uh, three uh, are, very, are possibly very important for, for the rubber sector. First, cooperative approaches that involves countries working with one another using uh, internationally transfer mitigation outcomes, so em emission reductions, if, if you will, to achieve their, their, their NDCs. So the characteristic of all of this is still under discussion. Uh, most parties believe that these emission reductions to, to be tradable uh, should be real, verifiable, and quantifiable. Then there is the sustainable development mechanisms. It's Article 6, point, paragraph 4, uh, that has been established. Um, it is to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission and support sustainable development. So the idea here was to take lessons from the Kyoto Protocol mechanisms, such as the, the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanisms, in, in, in some of the elements of it, and, 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 and also how to use the, the so-called share of proceeds towards, uh, towards adaptation. And then, finally, non-market approaches. It's Article 6.8. Um, and these are considered to be uh, actions and activities that address mitigation and adaptation but do not necessarily result in, in tradable units. Uh, the discussion on the topic is currently quite vague, but uh, there have been indications that it may include financial measures and policies, and the framework to promote these approaches uh, was established under another uh, paragraph, uh, paragraph nine of, of, of this article. So, uh, and in addition, as you may know, there is another mechanism uh, that the International Civil Aviation Organization has agreed to in 2016 is was to set up an, a, a new offsetting mechanism to compensate the growth of, of aviation emission post-2020, that is called CORSIA, uh, Carbon Offsetting and Redu Reduction Scheme for International Aviation, an airline will purchase offset from international uh, schemes. Uh, Another important uh, make, uh, entry point potentially is about harvested wood products or HVWP. Uh, uh, carbon stocked in harvested wood products can be accounted as for a sink. Currently, that does not act, take into account uh, rubber, nor, nor bamboo, nor rattan. And there could be value in proposing to integrate uh, rubber, bamboo, and rattan uh, as harvested uh, root products uh, and, and such proposal could have more weight if uh, there would be strong evidence with number. Perhaps that rubber does not does that on its own but, but, but does that jointly with bamboo and rattan and if a, some kind of a consortium could, could support uh, that, 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 that integration. So finally to, to conclude, um, we, we think that uh, th there is, there are several potential entry points for rubber in the climate change uh, negotiation, discussion, and implementation. The question is more what can be put on the table and where, and, and how then we can bring that on the table. So when we look at the Coronivia Joint Work Plan program, sorry, on agriculture, 
this program looks very much at how to properly present risks and manage risks, uh, prevent risk and manage risk to production. So this is where it could be highlighted that such system of, of risk monitoring for weather, pests, diseases, shall, shall also cover plantations, including rubber, and not just you know, agricultural food crops. Uh, then second, there is the issue of carbon accounting within the NDCs. We've seen that everything needs to be uh, evidence-based, quantifiable, uh, reliable. So how can we how can we do that for 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 properly for rubber? The issue of harvested wood product I, I just mentioned, including rubber, rattan, and bamboo. The IPCC itself, uh, and especially the six uh, assessment report that is coming up, uh, needs and uh, needs to to include rubber. Uh, in, in the fifth assessment report, there was miscanthus. There were other crops mentioned. But, but rubber wasn't, so how can we correct uh, this, especially in the adaptation reports that are regional? And then there are the funding uh, mechanisms such as the Green Climate Fund, and here there is sectoral guidance on how the fund applies its investments. C4 is currently supporting the GLF in, uh, when it, it is writing its sectoral guidance on, on land use, agriculture, and forestry, and here we need to make sure that some of the elements and including the, the three dimension of sustainability, including uh, say the social components that, that are, are, are properly taken into account. Then how, how, did, how to do that? I mean, these are just doors, uh, but, but how to open these doors and how to, to start engaging. So that was first one of the objective of, of this event when we first discussed uh, it at the initiative of uh, of the co-organizers, RSG, IRDB, CIAD, C4, FTA. So we believe by, by some of the outputs of this event, of this event, we can, we can make a contribution. Then I think we have a mandate, uh, all of us, to, to try to, to bring better numbers. I mean, Salvatore mentioned that from, this, from the smallholder and social dimension. It's, yeah, carbon is a big issue in the climate, but since the Paris Agreement has broadened it to sustainable development, and make better connection. It's also about jobs, about new material substitution, etc. Uh, and this is something where we, the private sector could also play a, play a role in providing uh, better data. Then the, the issue of uh, the renewal of plantation. Uh, th there has been many uh, discussion about uh, forest and land landscape restoration. There has been a project, a big forest landscape restoration, the first one of it agreed by the Green Climate Fund just a few months ago, it's eucalyptus. So can, can also rubber, as also because it brings some productive and, and job dimension, be, be included in, into the picture and, and, and how, especially when uh, looking at, for example, the slide of, of, of Michael Brady, some of the plantations needs to be, to, me, to be renewed right now. And then the last point is the private sector, uh, when we look at life cycle analysis uh, versus synthetic rubber, but also versus other products, that's central points to to, uh, to 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 start the discussion uh, later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vincent, for your uh, presentation. Uh, um, now we can uh, move to the next speaker. Uh, that is Alexandre uh, Meinbeck from C4FTA. Uh, his paper is on uh, opportunities for natural rubber in national determined contribution and the national adaptation plans processes. Alexandre, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Salvatore. So I'm trying to put, yeah. So uh, this, this intervention is very much a complement to what uh, Vincent has just presented. As Vincent has said, one of the very big changes that introduces the Paris Agreement is everything now is bottom up. It's coming from countries and, and from national strategies and, and programs. So the the what I'm going to present to you is coming out of uh, a collaboration we, we have with FAO on, on both regional synthesis of NDCs and on 
what can be done to better integrate forestry, trees, and agroforestry in the national adaptation plans. So NDCs and NAPs are quite different, but they share some uh, common characteristics. They are policy documents that are meant to orient all national policies, measures, planning, finance related to climate change. And this can be extremely broad because now climate change has to be mainstream everywhere. They have been established by the UNFCCC, and this is very important because countries are committed to UNFCCC to deliver on these programs, and also because as they are part of the international picture, they orient now most of the funding from international funds, like the Green Climate Fund and other, and also funding from other donors, and in particular, uh, development agencies from developed countries. And last important common point, they are periodically reviewed. They are, however, very different uh, in nature and scope, and this is why I'm going to deal first with NDCs and, and then with the NAP. So the NDCs are very short documents. They, they are an international commitment, what a country promises to do to the international community. So they, are, they may be just a few pages with broad orientations. They need to include mitigation commitments. This is mandatory. The adaptation part is optional, but all developing countries have included an adaptation part. As Vincent has said, the first set has been prepared in 2015, and we are now in their implementation. They are, they have started this year, in fact. So what we really can do, as I've said, it's broad orientations and principles. So now we need to look for opportunities in the implementation of the NDCs, in producing countries, of course, but also in consuming countries. And this is where bioeconomy can be included. Uh, and to make the link between NDCs and national adaptation plans, the national adaptation plans are often mentioned in the NDC as the vehicle for the implementation of the adaptation part. Then, as I said, they are documents, but they are also processes with monitoring of the implementation and the preparation of the next set of NDCs, and there again, there are opportunities to be sized in order to support the making the NDC more ambitious. And now I think what we have to keep in mind is that governments have very quickly prepared these NDCs and now they are trying to figure out how they are going to make it. So a sector that can arrive with a kind of easy solution saying, oh, if you do that, you create a carbon sink of this and that, it's very likely to get through. Uh, one very important point is that forest and land use are very present in the NDCs. More than three quarters of countries include land use as, as a way to achieve their objectives. It is second only to the energy sector, which means that in almost every NDC, particularly in developing countries, there are opportunities on which to link the measures and actions that we want to promote. And another extremely important point with all the changes that has mentioned Vincent, is land use is the sector that is the most frequently mentioned for synergies between adaptation and mitigation, as well as for sustainable development co-benefits. And this is a huge uh, asset for our sectors. But what are the very concrete opportunities? Rubber itself is rarely mentioned, 
which is normal because it's very short. Indonesia explicitly mentioned the use of rubber wood for energy production in its NDC. And then, as I've said, there are broad orientations on forests or plantations to which can be linked policies and measures for implementation. And also the question of biomaterials in consuming countries. And, and we can also get involved in the revision of the NDCs. And in all of that, what is so important, especially talking to the research sector, is to bring good evidence, quantitative and qualitative. And not only on carbon benefits, but also to all co-benefits. So switching to the NAPs, which are closer to the implementation, and to give an idea, I've said six pages for the NDC of Malaysia, a NAP is generally more than 100 pages, was established 10 years ago. The objective is to reduce vulnerability to all impacts of climate change by building resilience, and to facilitate the integration of adaptation in all policies, plans, measures of countries. Very important for us and for this workshop is that explicitly it shall be guided by best available science. And these last two days we, we heard a lot about good available science to be brought to the attention of, of countries. And another important thing is that the first generation of NDCs have already been published, but countries are in the process of developing their NAPs. 20 of them have been published, the other ones are being written currently. Uh, one point to keep into account when we want to integrate forestry or rubber in the NAPs is how it links to other sectors and other concerns. And for rubber, for instance, one of the big assets of the sector is how it contributes to smallholders' livelihoods, because smallholders are the most vulnerable to climate change. So a sector that supports their income is so important in the global economy of national adaptation plans. Uh, just to give a brief idea of what can be the structure of an app, because this is where you can get into it. Most of the time, they're organized by sectors, you know, agriculture, industry, water. In some other cases, they can be regional. Uh, but this uh, document is only a picture of the process itself, because the NAP is supposed to go on for years and years, because we are going to need to adapt in, in the years to come. So it gives an idea of how you can get involved in the discussion. So very broadly, forests in general are often integrated in the ecosystems and biodiversity section. In some countries, you have a specific forestry section, like in Cameroon, or it can be linked to agriculture, like in Togo or in Chile. Chile is a very interesting example because there is a specific plan on the adaptation of plantations, which is part of a broader silvo agro pastoral plan. And this is why they have been able to put measures that are very focused on plantations. It's the same case in Sri Lanka. We had a very interesting presentation on, on the first day about it. <laughs> in the Sri Lanka app, you have a part on commodities and plantations, and rubber is fully integrated there. So the question of how the discussions are organized is very important for us to make an impact on, on the final plan. <coughs> so what are the main measures that we find in adaptation plans that have been already published? If you take for natural forest, uh, there is a lot about monitoring and risk management systems. This is a big concern. So weather changes, changes in the ecosystem and pests and diseases. A strong part also to research in general and ecosystem-based adaptation. When you look at planted forest, again, the importance of monitoring and risk management system, 
with the example of Chile, with the idea to have a broad pest and disease monitoring system covering all agricultural crops and planted forests to build on what Pence mentioned. Um, changes of planted species and varieties, and, and here the, the work on, on clones fits very nicely, conservation and sustainable management of genetic resources, and anticipating future changes by planting cultivars that will be adapted to the future climate. Another very important point that I want to highlight is that in so many NAPs, planting trees is a way to adapt other sectors, to restore watersheds, to establish windbreaks for agriculture, shade trees for agriculture, agroforestry in general, or to have, for instance, to have a cooling effect on cities. So it's also important to show how planting trees can help other sectors to adapt in, in this kind of broad national conversation. So, for instance, there, there are lots of measures on how you use trees in agroforestry system to be able to go on producing food in spite of climate change. Just some very quick examples of successful integration. I've already mentioned the example of Sri Lanka and, and probably among the reasons why it, it has been so successful in integrating rubber as part of the national plan was also showing its importance for resilience as of, of households, as Dr. Lashman uh, explained yesterday. Uh, in Cameroon, there is also rubber as part of the industry sector. Uh, I've already mentioned the example of Chile. Another very interesting point I want to highlight is how successful have been sectoral dialogues in countries that have implemented them, like Uruguay and Uganda. And what they have told us is that you have so much important information on vulnerabilities and what to do to adapt coming from these stakeholders dialogues that you do not find if you just make a desk study and and finally an important point linking also with the presentation of, of Amy uh, this morning is that many national adaptation plans also give place to sub-national efforts so there are things to be done at landscape level. So what can we do right now? There is often a lack of consideration in national processes for some sectors and we need to provide evidence of the contribution of the sector to the economy and employment. Big numbers on smallholders for instance. A sector focused adaptation reflection to identify vulnerabilities and means for adaptation is good both for the sector itself and to become integrated in national efforts. And we need also a dialogue between the sector and other sectors that might be interested, the industry, but also the water sector, cities. And, and finally, and this is so important, there is a need and, and great opportunities for the science community to be engaged and provide options and enabling conditions. I think that's it. This, again, taking the example of Sri Lanka, this is really an example of how good science can back up uh, the action of a sector to be properly recognized and supported uh, in national adaptation plans. And I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander, for your interesting presentation. And uh, now we go to our next speaker, that is my colleague from uh, LSG, Lakshmi Nahir. Uh, Lakshmi will give a presentation on climate risk, what a 1.5 degree pathway for rubber fora. Uh, Lakshmi, please, the floor is yours.
Lakshmi? Yes, hello. Yeah, are you there? Yeah. Yes, I'm just you trying start to your presentation, please. Yes, I'm trying to share my screen first. Yes. Struggle. This one. This one, trouble, this one. Visual. The game button. Okay. Okay, we can see the presentation actually, yeah? we can. Actually, next me. Your presentation is on the screen, it's visible. You need to unmute. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for the technical hiccup. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Last two days of workshop, we had deeper discussion addressing the results of impact of climate change on rubber production, potential means of adaptation and contribution to mitigation of climate change. Thank you for uh, um, Vincent and Alexandra who have already covered some of the policy dimension which we need to address from an international fora focusing on the rubber space. My presentation will address the carbon mass from a policy perspective and potential scenario actions holistically from a bottom-up approach, the rubber space towards limiting global warming below two degrees Celsius. The rubber is grown in the annual mean temperature between 26 to 28 degrees centigrade. Mainly the rubber is grown in the Asia Pacific region. Of course, that is mainly coming from the Southeast Asian countries. Ma major researchers already pointed out what are the areas where rubber is shifting from the traditional to non-traditional region. We have seen it. And also there is, with the rise in temperature, we have seen a shift from the, within a region from the traditional to the marginal lands. Then coming to the climate mass, it is really daunting. One has to look into the decarbonization, both from the mitigation point of view and scientists have already brought in different estimation for carbon mass, which limiting the warming to 1.5 degree, which would reduce the most dangerous and irreversible effect of the climate change. The good news is that 1.5 pathway is technically achievable, but the pathway should require dramatic emission reduction over the next 10 years starting from now. So looking at the carbon CO2 emissions, which is a long pathway, I have taken the McKinsey's recent analysis done from this perspective. Global population is increasing 
along with the global growth. One who is looking at the global growth, we can see that every 1% increase in GDP is associated with a 0.5% increase in CO2 emission. This is really daunting. And if you look at the McKinsey's calculation, we have to reach 1.5 degree global warming. There is a huge reduction in emission. Already by 2030, the projection shows that there is 517 gigatons of CO2 emission as we reach 2030. That means we need to work a lot to reduce the CO2 emission. What is the pace transition pathway? Because as of now, CO2 emission per unit of output is very little as 2%. But the requirement is very huge. We have to bring around from this 2%, around 50 to 55% reduction to meet the 2030 level. And to bring in to a net zero level by 2050, that requires around 90% more reduction in emission. So what are the climate resilient low emission climate adaptation strategy? We could address generally as well as there are several. So there are five major economic and societal shift that would underline for a 1.5 degree pathway. First one is sustainable production. It's that cover a holistic approach starting from different cultivation approaches. We heard from various scientists who spoke last two days. It could be, a, now the terms are changing. It's not the good agriculture practices. It is the climate smart agriculture. And then halting deforestation is uh, a key element. Uh, how to discourage deforestation, especially from a small farmer's point of view. Then one element which is not directly addressed in the last two, date of, uh, two days of deliberation is how we can curb the waste more into a circular economy perspective. Embracing the circular economy and boosting efficiency in the planting material and industries decrease the greenhouse gas emission and this reduces cost and improve efficiency performance. If you look into the renewable raw materials and bioenergy sources, this is another key area where um, the rubber space also need to look into for uh, reducing the CO2 emission. Then electrification is a massive decarbonization driver for transport and building. And if you look at the total CO2 emission, transport sector and agriculture contribute around two thirds of the total emission. And specifically, if you look at the transport sector, one fourth of the emission is coming from the transport sector. So how and what are the policies need to be there to offset this level of emission? So carbon ca uh, capture and carbon sequestration activities, this is an, another area where uh, the industries and the players in this space need to look into for the, the next 10 years to reach the target line of 2030 as well as the target line of 2050. Specifically coming to the, the rubber space, what could be the transition to a 1.5 degree pathway for rubber? This is more addressing from a life cycle of the product point of view, starting from the production to the recycling and reuse of the product. To begin with the sustainable production. So we in detail heard about the land use changes and the farming practices from many uh, speakers and also the, the previous two speakers also addressed this more in detail from a policy perspective. Beyond from the land use and farming practices, what are the policies and the action to be done? So first one is the responsible sourcing. 
starting from the traceability of the land and how uh, the, the rubber and the rubber products and overall carbon footprint and the business strategies can address the efficiency of the raw material and both from a free supply chain as well as from a circular economy point of view. To bring back that into the discussions on the bioeconomy, which is already addressed by a previous speaker in the session four, beyond natural rubber, the synthetic rubber who is um, coming into the, the general rubber space started addressing the, the bioeconomy, the main feedstock, which is uh, fuel based the butadiene now started looking into biobutadiene production and from the biobutadiene production, the bio-based uh, BR and SSBR, which is mainly going to the major inducer market, the tire. If I take the example of the major inducer, the tire sector, how the tire sector is looking into the circular economy and what is the mass behind the CO2 emission from the tire business? Looking into the raw material side, around 12% of the CO2 emission is coming from the production side. And then 1% is, is within the distribution side. And the major share of the emission is happening in the use phase. That is around 86% of the emission is happening in the use phase of the tire or the automotive industry. And then it is, the collection of the end of the life of the product. That phase, it is 1% of the emission is happening. And the last phase is reusing. Reusing phase, it, it can be brought back to the different type of materials which have wide variation, or we can bring back into the original form, either it, it as natural rubber or synthetic rubber, which could be possibly re replace the virgin source. I can give some examples. Some of the major leaders in the tire space has already made announcement and commitment of reusing such raw material, around 30% of the requirement. This is one good example where the, the private sector is com coming in uh, to make the commitment starting from the industry and from the industry to the national level. And this can be brought back to the, the global rubber space. And beyond the tire sector, the non-tire sector, there are wide range of materials, even though the, the consumption is only around 30% of the total natural rubber space. The recycling possibility and reuse of the both natural and synthetic rubber, which is coming from the, the non-tire application, that is also very wide. But certainly this needs partnership. There are various projects developing in collaboration, addressing the recycling from the non-tire segment. So decarbonization drive, this is the major element. Of course, this is half of the challenge to be addressed for a CO2 emission perspective. The decarbonization electric vehicle is the major driver um, addressing the decarbonization drive. We have already seen various emerging market and the developed market started addressing this electric vehicle. So we can see that in China around the, um, is a major consumer of the vehicle, electric vehicle, though China is the largest emitter of the, the CO2. And coming to what are the best mitigation policies and what are the, the strategies or the instruments to address these mitigation policies. Carbon tanks, which is covered earlier in detail, but I like to bring that the, the perspective which the rubber sector could address here is to bring a tax on the, the processing of the plants based on how much is the CO2 emission and also for the whole industry in proportion to their carbon content. Then next one is emission trading system. In emission trading system, the firm must hold an allowance for each ton of their emission. 
and the government can set a cap on total allowances or emission or the market trading of the allowances stabilizes on the emission price. The fee base is also bringing some uh, scale of fees on products and activities with an above average emission rate. There are already different regulations in place for example, the standards for emission rates for vehicles, which is very much uh, common now in both emerging market as well as um, developed mature markets. The energy efficiency in the electricity and the products are also now in place in developed market. And also there is minimum requirement for the use of um, renewables in the power generation industry. So, there are also some digital technology solution which the both the science and the global uh, rubber community can tap into this like the, the blockchain and the gis which we can look into how much is the emission coming from different space it's if you look into the jurisdictional approach for example we can tap into that and uh, for example, a blockchain um, technology can be used and the token can be passed from one place to another and the total uh, emission can be calculated and offset against uh, a certain industry. Specific to the rubber industry, what are uh, the adaptation uh, and the mitigation actions and also how the tree as a whole could be used as a carbon sink to offset the CO2 emission. It is possible to chart a 1.5 degree pathway that does not remove the carbon dioxide to offset the ongoing emission. This is a mass, but this mass simply doesn't work. Reducing the carbon emission is no longer enough to halt the impact of the climate change. For example, if you look at the, the uh, rubber plantation, I know that this uh, research report most of the scientists are familiar with. I'm just quoting also Dr. Aziz mentioned in his uh, inaugural talk, around 40 million um, tons of uh, CO2, which is possible to absorb with more than 300 million or around 400 million hectares of natural rubber. This is a very good uh, mass which the sector could use in different um, international level dialogue and discussions on bringing or integrating natural rubber into the UN level or uh, climate summit discussions. Reducing the carbon emissions is no longer enough to hold the climate impact. The ecosystem-based adaptation and the national adaptation plans. Already these two topics was uh, discussed in detail by the two earlier uh, speakers. And carbon capture and carbon sequestration, if this is an area certainly we need to discuss how collaboration and integration in the rubber space can be done. The climate finance, uh, Vincent has already brought uh, in detail some of the policy dimension we could address on um, uh, climate fund. But certainly this is a fact. In addressing the climate change, we need investment. Then large scale investment is required to significantly reduce emission. How can we encourage to bring more investment uh, to attract uh, or to support small farmers to discourage deforestation? This is something uh, um, the rubber space or the producing countries more addressed to the small farmers we could look into. I like to bring one example here because this is most of the industry players and uh, those who are in the natural sp rubber space known about this. This is the, um, the collaborative project on green financing landscape. That is one good example of the green investment between Barito, Michelin, and the TLFF, which is already in place. But of course, this is a good project bringing more jobs into the rural community as well as to the, the rubber farmers who are more focused uh, in an eco ecosystem-based adaptation. 
And then this can be upscaled with the right financing partners. This is, this is one policy option which can be used in other countries and um, how this could be addressed at the global level. This is a policy uh, element for discussion in the next panel session. Next screen. Uh, you have to close the presentation, please. Yes, this is the last slide. Yeah, what you. is the pathway for the rubber for our moving forwards? The actions are already initiated by the country level as uh, already mentioned in the NDC and the NDP uh, action plans. But looking at the rubber segment, around 40 million hectares of rubber plantation, it's a very strong uh, carbon sink. And then proper plan for replanting of old trees with a good uh, ecosystem model rather than a monocrop, intercropping and the mixed cropping that is well aligned with the, the national NDC3, which is uh, mentioned earlier. And then decarbonizing supply chain via regulatory framework to bring it free of deforestation and with an assured traceability check on the land origin. Because this is indirectly is yes, uh, encouragement for small farmers to not to go for deforestation and assured living income from rubber farming for social safety net for millions of small farmers. Of course, this is uh, brought in uh, for discussion in the earlier panel by Dr. Aziz. The living income concept is uh, already addressed in other crops like uh, coffee and cocoa. And also this topic is brought under discussion uh, not at formally, but this will be come soon in a formal way with the major producing countries, consuming countries, IRSG, IRDB, ANRPC, um, and the global platform on natural rubber. Then reuse of the natural rubber from the end of the life of the product. This is an area where certainly collaboration and partnership is needed. One industry or one country alone um, cannot address this and it's a time for um, act to now on the bioeconomy and the circular economy. Green financing to encourage climate adaptation in natural rubber as yes, uh, Vincent has already addressed this. International accounting of carbon in biomass and its value addition. This is also mentioned by earlier speaker as yes, this is an area we need to collaborate and uh, how we can collaborate this, how we can account for carbon in biomass as well as for the, the furniture and other wood products. It's a um, question to be addressed and work together. Public private sector collaboration, mitigation and adaptation. And of course, for this, we have to create awareness. And this is a wonderful opportunity we do have now the exchange of information and what it is happening at the, the uh, scientific side. This is already need to be conveyed beyond the scientific community to the general rubber community and the climate uh, community, which uh, um, Vincent has already pointed out. And also people has to adopt it. That is very relevant for uh, a sector where millions of small growers and more than 90% of the production is coming from the small grower side. Then integration of the rubber in mitigation policies, measures and adaptation policies and how these uh, discussions as a holistic approach starting from bottom to the top, how we can bring the discussions in uh, climate summits and other UN FCC and other discussions. Okay, thank you. I think it's, um, uh, I'm passing this back to the chair, uh, Salvatore. Thank you, Lakshmi. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I think we have some uh, time, um, 10 minutes, for some discussion and uh, Q&A session. There is anyone from the speakers that would like uh, to make further, further comments? Uh, you know, Vincent or Alexandre? No, there is a question from uh, Dennis Songwa. Yes. 
but actually it was for Vincent. So yeah, I, it was, it, I it asked was you. for me, but, but I, I guess many, many of the, the yeah, sure. presenters the, the, in all these workshops could, uh, could, could reply to it. This is a very good question. I mean, who should really take the initiative and at which level to, to, to engage into, into, into this discussion and, 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 and bridge, and bridge these this, this silos? Uh, so, um, I, I would really think that here, of course, the, the, the national level actors, the national institutional actors have a, have a key role, so the representation. So, it's true that when the smallholders are not represented at national level, that makes it difficult, but still that there is an organization of the sector, there are, there are producers, etc. Uh, there is a value chain and this is a, this is a key, a key uh, a key, a key stakeholder to mobilize. Then there is research. I think research, and and, and the linkages that this institution can have with with the ministries, uh, and, and looking at, at at these processes, being being be informed, etc. And then there is probably also a, a role but that's more a suggestion to to IRSG in in providing some guidance. And maybe this is one of the follow up of 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 this workshop. Say, okay, you don't know how to engage. These are the things. These are the processes going on, and this is how you can you can engage and what you can what you can bring. And this could be something that that the IRSG could, could could consider doing for for its members. Yeah, if if it's not already the case, but it, it's it's not it's not it's new territories maybe for some of the actors. But but there is there there are ways to explain how to to engage into this based on good examples, as as Alexandre also has shown in his presentation. Yeah, yes, yeah. so if, if I can say something about this, I think uh, now RAB has a lot of uh, organization um, associations and um, but in a way, you know, this workshop is an answer uh, or a first answer to the question that um, our friend has, uh, has put um, because the issue is not who has to get the lead. Uh, but how we proceed in uh, organized, coordinated fashion. Uh, I think this is, this is the main point. Most likely there will not be the lead of one organization. And in my view, there should be the cooperation of various organizations in uh, trying to reach a goal. Now, first we have to set the goal and we have to set uh, an action plan. Uh, to reach that goal. So I think uh, that could come um, from discussion like this and from follow-up of this discussion, being sure that everyone uh, will be uh, involved in it. Yes, I, I think one of the strengths, and uh, pointing to that, and, and of, of the sectors we've seen that uh, there are many actions, a range of actions that can be a solutions that can be mobilized both for mitigation and for adaptation. And, and, and there is a range of different organizations that, that tackle all of this in different ways uh, uh, from, from the genetic resources aspect, the improvement on clones with, with IRDBs, the, the issues of technical itineraries, um, you know, from, so in analysis, uh, incentives, um, household economics to 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 look at uh, how that can strengthen smallholder livelihoods through different approaches, including diversification, etc. So I think yeah, fully right. The point is is how to coordinate all of this and 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 bring bring the positive elements and the solution element to the table because one of the bottleneck that exists in the current climate discussion is more about the solutions and and some of and, and also the, the how the solutions can bridge um, a big gap between a, a, a technological industrial fix often large scale uh, and something that is more conducive to the objective of smallholder livelihoods and food security Just to add one point to, uh, as a follow-up of uh, Vincent's comment, because um, in this space, data visibility is not very clear. 
So what we could do for getting that data visibility? Without data visibility, you, we all have a set of solution and technology side is the science-based evidence is there. But if the data is missing, the implementation and further discussion is uh, difficult. How we could address this and how we could get a better data, this is also an area for discussion among different agencies at the global space. Uh, Alexandre, do you, do you have any questions, any yeah, comments? May, maybe, maybe just just uh, a first reflection on, on why rubber is, is often less mentioned, is it, or even not at all. It, one of the entry points, of, in the major entry point for the agricultural sector in, in the climate change discussions was food security. And it has been a bit easier or, or people are more used to mention coffee, cocoa, even though their impact on food security is providing income exactly like rubber. So one thing that needs to begin is just to mention rubber as, as part of the, just to take a, an example, a week ago, Vincent made a presentation to, to the Science Council of the CGIR, he had four minutes, and in these four minutes, he mentioned rubber. It was so unusual that yesterday I had another meeting with some other people that listened to that, and, and thinking about food security, they said, oh, but we have not to forget the impacts on livelihoods. Take rubber, for instance. So wh what I'm pointing out is that there is a very powerful narrative of the rubber sector renewable material, 90% of it from smallholders, uh, so important for some countries, so that once we have the right narrative with some data behind and some evidence, if everybody has the reflex to put it in the appropriate place when reviewing the reports of the IPCC, when having a discussion with the private sector, when that it will gradually come into it. And part of the narrative, as Salvatore said, it is the institutions that are supporting the rubber sector, the strong integration with the private sector, which is also now something that the general discourse on climate is very much looking for, because everybody now is realizing that it is not only the task of governments to do something, but for everybody, including private sector consumers, there is also the discourse. So we, we have to enter in all these discourses, bioeconomy, sustainable world, adaptation, and as Vincent has shown, all these discourses are around the negotiations. And, and by experience globally, you begin discussing a topic in a side event, and one year after it is taken on board, and two years after it's entering the negotiations proper. There are ways to influence the, the whole discourse. And, and, and also there is the national, so there are various entry points, the national one, the international one, private sector one, and the global discourse on contribution to food security in a more sustainable world. I think it's five o'clock. <laughs> uh, if there are no other comments, uh, I think we can close this session and uh, have 10 minutes break. And then uh, we'll come back for the final panel discussion.